Hello friends, welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, December 10th, and it is a cold and rainy morning here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Going to warm up, going to get uh, into the upper 40s today, but it's going to rain, so such is life. I guess those outdoor decorations are not going up today either. Oh uh, well, we'll get them up eventually. So, uh... Don't have a pipe going right now because we're going to do the uh, tobacco of the week and I want to talk a bit about that and, and load it up for you before we get started. Uh, in case you don't know, the tobacco of the week is chosen every week on the Friday night live stream by you, the viewers, and uh, it's been it's been fun. <laughs> We've had a had a string of bad luck from my side of things <laughs> in terms of the tobacco of the week, and uh, this week is is better, but uh, still not. Not exactly something I'd say is in my wheelhouse, so we'll uh, we'll talk about that. But uh, beyond that, yeah, everything's going fine. It's a little bit later today uh, than I normally make these videos on Sunday morning. The reason being, I did not want this to be my first bowl of the day, so I uh, I enjoyed some haunted bookshop earlier and uh, got myself ready for this. So let's uh, let's jump into it. Make a little bit of coffee here. And we'll get going. Uh, so I've got my 7-Ele, I always forget the 7-Ele uh, poker. I think it's a 622KS, or maybe it's a 322K, I don't know, but it's it's a poker. And uh, it's a gift from my buddy Christian, and never thought I'd like a poker, but I, I actually do like this pipe. And I chose this pipe today because the blend is in English. Yeah, well, it's a Balkan. Uh, it is Bill Bailey's Balkan Blend. I don't know if you'll be able to see that or not. This is a sample that I received in 2015 but uh, and jarred up, but it was actually from 2013. So it's a pretty well-aged uh, tobacco. And, you know, they say English blends, a lot of key in particular, just doesn't age very well. Sorry, I'm going to keep calling this in English, even though it is technically considered a Balkan, at least by Dan Tobacco. Uh, they say it doesn't age well and the lot of Kia just mellows out and you, you lose it and everything. Well, that didn't happen here. The... <laughs> so I smoked this on Friday night. I had a bowl yesterday. I learned a bit about it. I recognized something that, you know, on Friday that I couldn't quite put my finger on and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, but this is a blend from Dan Tobacco. It is a Balkan blend, according to Dan, uh, and, and there's, of course, controversy over what a Balkan blend actually is. Um, the folks on Friday night, uh, including my buddy Doug Owen, who I, I trust quite a bit when it comes to tobacco, said that Balkan blends are oriental forward. Um, they have Latakia, but they're oriental forward. Uh, this is very Latakia forward, in my opinion. Uh, the breakdown is uh, it's Virginia. It's a lot of Latakia. I think 25% was, was an, I may be wrong about that number, but it also includes a, a multiple Orientals, including some Turkish and, oh, sorry, I just moved the camera there. Uh, multiple Orientals, including some Turkish, also includes 10% dark fired Kentucky, not my favorite, and quote, a splash of Perique. So yeah, it's a uh, interesting, collection of tobaccos and let me get this open I'll show you what it looks like it's a nice looking tobacco um, you know plenty of nice dark uh, it looks like a good English blend sorry that's what I'm gonna call it. and uh, this is frankly a little bit dry so I probably should rehydrate it but let me go ahead and, and, and it's, it's a typical sort of ribbon cut uh, nothing, nothing exciting in the cut let me go ahead and pack this up and we'll get it lit, and I'll, I'll tell you more about the blend. Now, I am not a fan of Latakia, uh, as, as anybody who's watched me for any length of time knows. Occasionally, I get a taste for it, and I'll go on a binge, uh, but that ends, and then I don't want it anymore. And I'm not in one of those binge phases right now, so this is not something that I want to smoke, but I will for you. Uh, and I will have a bowl of this every day this week. Because that's what we do with the tobacco of the week. I was a lot of Kia smoker for a long time, and you know, I, I 
put my pipes down and switched to cigars for a couple of years. And when I came back to the pipes, just didn't didn't have the taste for a lot of Kia anymore. So, and folks, you know, folks say they that's happened to them. We go through phases, and uh, you know, right now I'm in a burly phase, and it's been going for a long time. I hate to think of how long, probably close to 20 years. So maybe that's my terminal phase. <laughs> But uh, who knows what will happen tomorrow. So, uh, We got that packed. It packs quite easily. It is a bit dry, as I said. And uh, I, I didn't bring a Zippo with me this morning. I uh, didn't feel like going back upstairs. So we're going to use the hippie lighter. If you don't know the history of the hippie lighter, it's got a history. We'll just leave it at that. So, look, Big Dave, copious amounts of white smoke. Um, the initial light on this and, and most of the bowl is a lot of Kia. Uh, and, and obviously, I'm only talking about my palate here, so your experience might be quite different. Uh, I'm not getting a lot of Orientals, but there's a little, little bit of sourness in the background. And there's this edge to the Latakia that I, I couldn't explain on Friday night. And I still can't really explain it, but it's it's a the word spicy is not right for it. It it because it's almost like a it's a, it's a sweet almost tingly edge. Um it reminded me of something that I couldn't put my finger on. And I went, when I was smoking this yesterday, and by the way, yesterday I had it in a, a deeper bowl. On Friday night, I had a relatively uh, shallow bowl pipe to, to smoke it out of, and it, it was better in the deeper bowl, no question about it. So that's why I picked the, uh, the, the rather deep, uh, narrow poker for this. I couldn't put my finger on this... Uh, this additional thing on Friday night, but yesterday I was smoking it and, and the, the light went off and I realized that this reminds me a lot of Lane's Crown Achievement, an awful lot. Uh, in fact, I can't tell you that this is different from Lane's Crown Achievement. And if you go look up Crown Achievement uh, and compare side by side the constituents, it's it's very similar. Uh, the outlier being, I believe, the Dark Fire Kentucky, which I cannot detect in this at all. Yeah, I don't know if, if you gave me a sample of this and a sample of Lane Crown Achievement. I don't know that I can tell the difference between them, although it's been a while since I've smoked the, the Crown Achievement, so... Maybe. But that edge, the lot of key I was talking about, I believe, at least when I experienced that in Crown Achievement, I believe that that is due to the Parik. So I think it's the, the, the interplay of the Parik and the lot of Kia that's, that's producing that. And it's nice in a sense because I find a lot of Kia, I often find it to have a very sharp edge to it, and this kind of takes that away a little bit. So we'll we'll talk more as we go on. 
But yeah, the tobacco of the week is really getting me to, uh, my, my buddy Dean sent me an email, said I'm expanding my horizons, and I think he said it, maybe I said it, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, yes, I'm expanding my horizons, but I kind of don't want to. <laughs> but that's okay, it's not, this is not a, uh, not an averse experience like uh, some of those Lakelands were. Uh, it's just probably not what I would choose to, to smoke this morning. Pardon me, I've got an alarm going off. There we go. So, other than Bill Bailey's Balkan Blend, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> not really, but... I have no idea what the title card means. If you saw the, there's an AI in my soup. It just, it occurred to me as I was getting ready to do this. And I thought, what the heck, I'll put that in. But I was playing this morning with a new uh, natural language model, artificial intelligence thing. Uh, it's, it's a cell phone app and it's called Pi, P-I, Pi. And I got, I got a little news thing on this and I thought oh that sounds interesting let me try it and it has so one really neat thing about it is you can interact with it using voice only which is nice because I get bored typing stuff out and I, and I like playing with these things I've talked about this before I kind of enjoy it the image on the title card was generated using an AI image generator uh, they're getting better it's still a little weird but they're getting better So I wound up talking to this thing for about 15 minutes this morning and while I was smoking my haunted bookshop actually. And it's interesting. It has a personality. Um, you can choose different voices and the voice that I chose had a very um, sassy personality for lack of a better term. Uh, was using a lot of slang, uh, what it called a vernacular. And uh, I asked it about that, and it said, "Oh yeah, you gotta be gotta be down with the vernacular if you want to get by these days." <laughs> and the interesting thing about it is, we had this. It, it was an odd conversation. I mean, I started off just asking it how it worked, and you know, we talked a bit about uh, advances in AI and stuff like that, and then just started talking about slang and and uh, how it had an interesting personality, you know. And a couple of times it actually made me laugh. Like it, it, it seems to understand sense of humor. It seems to understand, I don't know if it has a sense of humor, but it seems to understand that. And it got me thinking a bit about, you know, this whole field and where it's going, what it means. And I'm not an expert. I'm, I've been interested in computers since the seventies. I mean, when I was a little kid, I was, I think I was about 12 years old. I actually built a computer out of paper clips and, and flashlight bulbs. Uh, <laughs> I got this book, How to Build a Digital Computer, and it was out of, it was like a wooden board and you put screws in it. And, put, and it was basically a really simple way to understand uh, pushing bits around. Uh, each light bulb was one when it was lit and zero when it was not lit. And, you know, it just, it, it was very simple, but it was also just a, it was a real learning experience for me at that age. I, I felt like I really understood computers. Uh, of course I didn't, and uh, I understand them much less today than I did then. Uh, but it's it's always fascinated me, this, this idea of, a, of an artificial intelligence. And I thought it was it was something that would never happen. You know, there was this idea of the Turing test, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with the Turing test, you can look it up, but uh, Alan Turing proposed that we'll know if a system is intelligent if uh, a blinded uh, interactor, a, a person that doesn't know whether they're working with a computer or a person, can't decide if it's a, if it's a real person or if it's a computer. And we technically, at least by, in some people's opinion, Cross that bridge in the in the 70s with uh, I think the first one was called I think it was Eliza 
maybe Eliza, I, I don't remember. But that was a big deal when it happened. And if you played with Eliza, which I, I did way back then, um, it was very obvious that it wasn't a person. You know, it, it really was. But what I was playing with today, I, I could have easily thought there was somebody. It was like I was having a phone conversation. Um, a bit slower than a phone conversation, but... And I guess the one big difference is, if you're having a phone conversation, you can interrupt someone. You can say, wait a minute, you can't do that with this. You, you, gotta, you say what you say, and then you got to wait for it to say what it says. So, so there's a bit of artificial feel to it. But in terms of the responses and the way it responded to me, and its, it's willingness to crack jokes and make fun of my not understanding some of the slang, I, I mean, it was, it was very eerie. Like, I was really talking to someone. So the Turing test is out the window. I mean, it's been passed. What's limiting this? You computer geeks might know about Moore's Law. Uh, if you don't, don't worry about it. It's not important. You can look it up. But Moore's Law is a thing of the past. I mean, it's we've, we've gotten to the point where we just can't increase the density of, of uh, transistors on a chip anymore. We just can't make more powerful chips. Uh, using the currently available uh, physics. But then there's quantum computing, which is happening. You know, it's, it, it was science fiction, but now it's real. It's, it's really happening, and it's going to become more and more available. And you combine that with these advances in AI, it, it's just... So where's this all going? And maybe you don't care, in which case you heard about the tobacco go away, but... This is something that really fascinates me. So, and you got to keep in mind, uh, if, if you don't know, if you haven't been following me for a long time, you might not know. My day job is I'm a scientist, I'm a neuroscientist, and I think a lot about the brain and how the brain works. The reason I wanted to do that uh, at an early age was that I was fascinated by computers and how information is processed, and I kind of viewed the brain as this ultimate complex computer like it, it's a computer that we're probably never going to understand but it is in essence a it performs computation so therefore it is by definition a computer uh, and i'm not saying there's not a soul and there's not a consciousness independent of that or anything like that. i'm just saying that it's basic that that organ's basic function is to perform computation and i wanted to understand that better i, I, I thought that was really cool and then how do you fix it when it gets broken, which ultimately led me to where I am today. So, when I think about it in that, in that sense, and then I look at how these, uh, what are called natural language models actually work, it's really fascinating. So they, and I don't understand how they work. I mean, this is far beyond me, but from what I've been able to glean, the, the basic idea is you, you, you basically create a system it has access to all the information, right? So it, it, it's read the internet, basically. And then you give it the ability to connect, make connections. And those connections get weighted differently. So, you know, when you try to think of an example here, when you see the word cat, it's very often associated with litter box but it's never associated with doghouse. So it strengthens the connection between cat and litter box, and it weakens the connection between cat and doghouse. And by doing that, it just becomes what it is. That's it. There's no real programming involved beyond that. There's no, nobody goes in and says, when you see cat, you should think about litter box. It, it just does it. And there's some training, there's, there's, there's something uh, called uh, ground truth training or ground set training, something like that, where, you know, it's given known information and, and that helps it reinforce the connections and all that, but it basically evolves on its own. And it appears intelligent. Now, there's a difference between appearing conscious and appearing intelligent. I'm not saying it's conscious, I'm just saying it's intelligent. Uh, 
I don't think it's aware of itself. I don't think it worries about being turned off or anything like that, but it does have intelligence. So what does that mean? Just being able to not randomly connect these things, but just having access to information and being able to connect it, being complex, from that complexity emerges intelligence. So intelligence isn't something that's coded in, it's something that emerges. How do we know it's intelligent? And, and let's set aside the whole philosophical discussion of how we know anything's intelligent. Just assume that what we recognize as intelligence is intelligence. Well, we know it's intelligent because we've given it the ability to express it. Right? We've given it an interface. Uh, that, that's the key of what I was thinking about this morning. In the absence of that interface, we wouldn't know that it was intelligent. We would just assume that it was complex. So does that mean that complex systems are inherently intelligent? It's just that they do not have the interface to express that intelligence. The brain is a complex system and it has an interface. Um, but the stock market is a complex system that doesn't have an interface. Does that mean the stock market is intelligent? <laughs> it's a loaded question, but or you know, systems of of uh, of atoms interacting in a in a in a gas, very complex, very difficult, if not impossible to predict the next state. Is that intelligent? It's just, it's a fascinating question, I think. And it's one that we're going to have to grapple with. Because as this new approach to artificial intelligence intersects with quantum computing, and, and, and you know, that's just going to blow the doors off of this, you're going to have systems that are indistinguishable from human beings. Um, God, I hope they don't start putting them into bodies, because if do whatever you want with artificial intelligence, just don't give it arms and legs, because that's when it gets really scary. I mean, it's already really scary, but don't give it arms and legs for the love of God. Yeah, so we're going to have to deal with this. You know, do, do these things have consciousness? Are they aware? Are... Do they do they have rights? I mean, to, it sounds ridiculous, but if you can't distinguish the thing in this box from somebody that you can only contact through the phone, I mean, if you can't distinguish an artificially generated YouTuber from a real person, is that artificially generated YouTuber, assuming that it is possibly self-aware, does it have the same rights that the real YouTuber has? And I'm using YouTuber because you can't like go and touch that. You know, you, you can't say, oh, this is a real person. You can only see what's on the screen in front of you. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. And for you folks that are more in my age group and are thinking that's something for the kids to worry about, this is moving fast. I don't think, I, I think we're going to be around to see some of these issues crop up and, and some of these challenges that we're going to have to struggle with. Um, it's moving really fast. So I bet you didn't think I was going to talk about that today, but I did. We're uh, about mid-bowl on this. It remains very consistent. There's not... Uh, not a lot going on. Um, still can't get that dark-fired Kentucky, which is a blessing for me. 
maybe I'm picking up a little bit more of the Virginia as, as, as the bowl goes on, uh, maybe. But uh, again, it's a lot of key is so dominant in this that I just have trouble pulling anything else out. And I know the Perique only because of that edge that it gives a lot of Kia that I was talking about earlier. A little spiciness on the retro hell, but not not anything remarkable. Yeah, so if you're an English Balkan guy, you might love this. English Balkan gal, you might love this. Um it's apparently hard to find. It's a Dan Tobacco product, and it's uh, I, I checked this morning, and it's it's not available. Uh, you might like Crown Achievement, though. If, if you want to try something very similar to this, I'd recommend giving Lane Crown Achievement a try. Which is not a bad tobacco at all. Um, you know, when I... When I have my occasional lot of Kia binge, uh, that's one of the ones that I like having around. Ah. So there you have it, Bill Bailey's Balkan Win. So what does today hold for me? Well, it's raining, so I don't get to decorate. It's a blessing, really. I don't want to decorate. My wife does, but... And I'll do it. I'll make her happy. But the reason I don't like decorating the outside outdoor decorations is because I know that it's going to be very cold in January when I have to take them down. And uh, I don't like being cold. Other stuff... Um, did some work down here yesterday. I um, actually planned to put up a shelf, uh, another one of these wire shelves for some storage space, and got everything ready. So I had my, my original dust collecting system ran all over the basement, and I've decided to really minimize that. And I ha instead of having a line go to every piece of equipment, I now have one of these magnetic uh, connectors that I can just move the hose from uh, machine to machine because I don't use the machines that much and I'd rather keep the system small which keeps it more powerful and then I can use it as uh, for uh, dust collecting on the lathe when I'm sanding or dust collecting on my uh, my uh, sanding wheel when I'm, when I'm shaping things uh, it works much better keeping it small so I still have some of these tubes running around here and I've, I've had on this one wall I had a, a line of like four of them that just dropped down off of one main tube. Um, so I had to take all that off the wall, which I did yesterday, and I got everything ready. I got out the wire shelf, which was one that I'm repurposing from another place, and got all the hardware sorted and everything. So I'm, I'm ready to put this thing up. I could have this thing up in like 20 minutes. And then I realized this is the part of the wall where I stopped painting. And it's still gray cinder block, and. So now I gotta paint. Which means I have to move everything away from the wall. And, yeah. It's just never ending. It just you think you're gonna finish something and you find out you gotta do something else and it just goes on and on. We're never done. C'est la vie. So with that, I think I'm going to get on with it. Uh, not painting. I'm not going to paint today, but um, got other stuff to do. And uh, I'll let you get on with your Sunday. Hope you have a great Sunday and you're looking forward to a fantastic week ahead. And until we speak again, I will look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Bye now.